Hey guys, um, like Chuck said, my name is Kate. Um, and in November, I will be four years clean and sober. And so if you've been with Mosaic longer than that, you got to see me when I was not clean and sober. So thank you for putting up with me through that. Um, but before I tell you a little bit about my story, I wanna tell you that whatever you're going through is hard. Now, like Chuck said, you've heard lots of stories and we have tried to be bold and intentional about like my battle with alcohol, with other people's um, battles with sex and porn and drugs. But man, if those aren't you, whatever your struggle looks like, it's hard. I mean, bad things happen in this world. Maybe you're trying to overcome grief or bitterness or an injustice. Like in today's age, it is so hard. Um, when injustice happens to you, how do you get over that? How do you battle divorce or relationship problems? Like all of those things are very real and they can have these habits come out, these lying, these sneakiness. So I really just wanna pray for you guys right now for a minute, for because whatever you're going through in your business, in your life, whatever it is, it's hard and God cares about you. So will you guys just pray with me? Um, God, I thank you so much for this church family and for the ability to come up here and speak with confidence that, that these people love me and that my words won't have them judge me. Um, but God, you know what each and every person is going through, what their struggles look like, the pain that it is causing them, the things that are in their lives. And I just hope that you would help them see themselves the way that you see them because you made them awesome, you made them fantastic, and you made them with purpose to overcome this, and you have a way out for them. And so God, I hope that you would just protect them from the enemy who is working um, to make their lives worse. And I hope that you would please just give them the strength and the courage that they need to open themselves up to you. And God, please let them know that you care about them, you care about their business, you care about their lives, you care about their relationships, you care about their feelings. Um, and God, I hope that you will just encourage us through the rest of the week. Um, I hope that you would just speak through me for the next couple of minutes, God, and just um, let your name be glorified. Yeah. Amen. Um, I'm going to sit down because that's how I feel more comfortable. <laughs> um, so for all of you who are struggling with something, and for me, it was alcohol. Um, I have the disease of addiction, but that may not be what your struggle looks like, and that's okay. Um, so whatever you're struggling with right now, I hope you know it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that you're here right now in the middle of a freedom series where we just started a freedom study. Like, that is not a coincidence. Um, that God is trying to work in your life, that he has things to say to you, um, that he, he wants to help you, um, and that he's speaking to you. Um, and also, as Christians, I also feel like we have a really big stigma to overcome. Um, I went to rehab. That's part of my story. Um, I was a binge drinker, so I would drink for like days or a week at a time, almost to the point of hurting myself. Um, but then I could like snap back and get it together for a week or a month at a time. Um, and eventually, like I was really at the point where I'd been hospitalized twice. Um, I was almost to the point of hurting myself and, and my friend really had to intervene. Like you watch that show Intervention and it's not fun for the people who are, who are having that happen to them. Um, and so when I went to rehab, I don't know if you guys know this, but the statistic is one person in each rehab class. So it's usually one in 30 make it. And that was me. No other person through my rehab class made it clean for up to a year. I'm the only one left. Um, and you hear a lot of stories in there and you see the difference is that a lot of people simply don't know Christ. Um, a lot of them are struggling with things. Um, things that have happened to them. And my story is so different. Like, man, I've been a Christian all my life. Like I have known God and loved him and knows that he loves me. I don't have a trauma to overcome. I didn't come from a broken family. I don't have a thing that you can blame my addiction on. I don't have a thing that you can say, well, that makes sense because of this. Um, and so it was a really big struggle when I was in my mess. Like, why can't I just be happy? Why can't you just stop this? Um, well, one, it's because I have a disease and it's real. And two, I was actively struggling to better my life with Christ. I was changing my friends. I was getting in the word. I was moving here to Arkansas to be closer to my family. I started attending Mosaic the first time I'd attended church regularly since I was a teenager because I was growing back in my faith. Well, at the same time, I was falling deeper into my mess. And it seems like that can't be true, but it is. 
you can wholeheartedly love God and want to change and fail in your struggles. Um, and that's just so hard, especially because um, Christian can be said in such a negative way these times. Like you worry about how people are going to see you. It can be exchanged for like bigot or you should have it all together. Or if God really loved you, why would you be going through this? Um, so that's just not true. <laughs> um, so while I was going through my mess, God was working in my life. But do you really think it's a coincidence that when I hit my rock bottom, as we like to call it, that I was also actively pursuing Christ? Do you think the enemy just let me pursue Christ without using my faults against me? No. The first thing I did when I finally admitted um, that I needed help was talk to Pastor Anthony at the time who was here. Um, and he just said, well, Kate, of course, you're working at a church. The enemy's going to use everything he has against you. You know, if I hadn't admitted it, if I hadn't been trying to pursue Christ, he would have just let me live out my life in despair and in danger of hurting myself, but I wanted more. So he, the enemy used everything he had to hurt me, to hurt my family, to hurt this church. Like he doesn't want you closer to Christ. He is actively telling you not to listen to me because whatever you're going through is an alcohol, it's not the same. He's actively telling you that you can handle this on your own, that you don't need anyone else, that your relationship with God is strong enough to do it without saying your things out loud. And that's not true. It just isn't. So whatever you're going through, please know that there's somebody who doesn't want you to succeed, that he wants to, to hurt you and to hurt your family and your relationships. And here's the cool part, though, guys. God has a way out for you. Whether it is a trial you're going through, because the other part the enemy wants you to hear is that you don't have a thing. Something's being done to you and injustice is happening to you. So you don't have to do anything. That's also not true. Um, cause who faced the biggest injustice in the whole world? Jesus. Hello. You know, didn't do anything wrong. Died a very horrible death. Um, so don't listen to, to the enemy's voice when he tell you that. So whether you are struggling because of your sin or whether you are in a trial or you are in a struggle, God has a way out for you. Yeah. It is specific towards you. He has put people in your life. He has put scriptures in your life. He confirms what he's telling you in the world. Um, Priscilla Schreier calls it the mercy of confirmation because he knows we struggle. He knows we're not perfect. He will tell us and beat on our hearts and yell at us that we are loved, we are loved, we are loved. And we won't hear it until another person says, Leela, you are loved. Because we need that. Um, so I just really want you guys to know that whatever you're going through, God has a way out for you, that it's unique. Um, and here's something else. You are more than your struggle. You are more than your grief. You are more than your addiction. And here's something else. Because as somebody who's been clean for almost four years, I'm more than my recovery. I am more than four years. Um, you are more than whatever trials you have gone through. You're more than your grief. You're more than a widow. You're more than a divorcee. You're more than your job. You're more than a pastor. Um, you are so much more then that thing, you are a son or a daughter of a king. And that's pretty crazy. And then it gets even crazier, okay? So not only are you a son and a daughter of a king, but he has a use for you. And he is going to use your story in some way that you don't even know about. Um, so after my recovery, I realized, like, man, I... I can help. Like, how can I help other people? I had seen some of my friends who foster adopted children um, struggle because there's lots of rules, regulations go on for like who can watch your kids, how long they can watch your kids. So I um, went through the training to do respite care, so like part-time care for foster parenting. Um, yeah, I do full-time foster parenting. I don't do respite care. Um, so God changed my heart in that. And I think the reason he did that is because I hear this all the time. I don't know how you love them so much and then have your heart broken. Well, because that's how God made me. Because these kids come to me because their families are hurting, because their families are going through things that I went through. I mean, if I'd had a kid, who would have watched them when I was in rehab? They needed someone. Like, I had the crumbs and the hunters who loved me while I was in rehab. The crumbs brought Isley to see me on Thanksgiving in rehab. 
Like, who does that? I do that for families because they're broken and they need help. And they don't have the love and support that I had of Mosaic family, of a prayer team behind me the whole time that I was in rehab. They don't have people who still continue to pray for my sobriety. They don't have those things. So I also hear these words all the time, well, what did they do? Or I can never do that to my kid. Well, I did. I would have. So I have that empathy of seeing what they're going through. And I don't want to have kids. I want to love on these kids until they get to go home and have my heart broken again and again and again, because these are my kids and I give them back. And I'm going to have to do that again soon. Um, and that's going to be awful. Um, awful. I don't know if you've ever just had to turn off being a parent or not, but it's the worst. Um, but God has uniquely crafted my story so that I can do that. He has supernaturally gifted me to love children and then give them away. And he has supernaturally gifted you for something, for whatever that is, for whatever your struggle is, for whatever you're going through, for who your friends are. Because, man, while I was in my mess, my friends carried me. Their prayers carried me. Their faith carried me. My parents' finances carried me through rehab. And finances are also a really hard thing like that nobody talks about when it comes to addiction. But, man, finances ruin lives. Um, you know, like if you are in struggling and you just can't stop swiping that credit card, man, that is real. Whatever your struggle looks like, it is real and it is hard. But God has a way out for you. You have people here who are not going to judge you at all. They will be there for you for whatever your journey looks like. And so I just really hope that you can do one thing for me, um, that you can try and do one thing for me, is tell someone, anyone, that you need help. You don't have to tell them what it is. You can say, hey, I am struggling. Will you please pray for me? And then if you want to get all sorts of crazy and tell them what it is and ask for help, do what they tell you. It is not going to be fun. But if you just do what people tell you, do what that one person tell you, it's as simple and as hard as that. And if you need somebody who you know won't judge you, I mean, Lewis won't judge you, Chuck won't judge you, Leela won't judge you, Candy won't judge you, Laura won't judge you, Indy won't judge you if you're, you know, a teen, <laughs> you know, there are so many people here who love you. And so I just, I really hope that you guys know that you were fearfully and wonderfully made to do awesome things here. That's, I mean, that's just a great setup. It's like she took the ball and pitched it to me to, to launch this last uh, s installment of, so to speak, of our sermon series on living free. Uh, what she talked about with the, the foster parenting and God having a, a plan for your life, we hear that a, phrase a lot. That's what we're going to talk about today in this final part. Thank you, Chuck. I'm a tall guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about recycling, and I'm going to get into what that means uh, in just a minute. But in our society, we largely think, thank you, we largely think about freedom and the, being the ability to do it as we please. We think about freedom as being the, the, the doing what we want to do, when we please, what we want to do, when we please, where we please. And the message we hear loud and clear is do whatever makes you feel good in the moment. Take care of yourself. Look out for number one. But if I think, I think if we look at ourselves honestly, we will admit that that impulse is in us more than we care to admit. We, we're experiencing things in our lives. Uh, Kate talked about what she went through in her uh, recovery journey. And we look at that and we go, okay, I've got to do something. I've got to just do something that's going to make me feel better or be better in my life. And I don't think that's what freedom is. Let's talk about um, what freedom really is. We've talked about that over the last eight weeks. And I want to kind of sum up with kind of a, a recap of all of that um, very quickly. But just to kind of recap what we mean by what true freedom is. Freedom from the tyranny of anger. It might be your struggle. Controlling behavior in others. That's part of my story. Freedom from the control that we allow others to exert over ourselves through maybe unforgiveness. That may be your struggle. Maybe not setting appropriate boundaries with other people, letting other people control you in some way. Maybe it's the freedom from the allure of drugs or alcohol. That's Kate's story with the alcohol. Or some type of sexual addiction like pornography 
or acting out in inappropriate ways. Perhaps it's freedom from compulsive lying or fear, anxiety, depression, overeating, gambling, abuse, divorce, grief. You know, I could stand up here the rest of the morning and all throughout the week and just keep naming things that people are struggling with. And Kate talked a little bit about that as well. And that's, that's true. We've got some story, something that's in our lives that we don't want to be there. I don't know how many times I've said, if I could just get a grip on this one thing in my life, man, things would be so much better. This one thing. And I don't know what that one thing is for you, but it's probably something I've named already where you can just fill in the blank. So in the last eight weeks, we've talked about this whole process. And I want to go over three Ps with you. And I love alliterations. I love acrostics because that's what we do in Celebrate Recovery. There's an acrostic for everything. But in the last eight weeks, we've talked about, number one, power. The power that's needed to overcome these things that we've just listed. Maybe whatever it is that you filled in in that blank that's your issue, your one thing. We've also talked about the process And we've also talked about the people that God uses to free us from those things. The power, the process, and the people. The first thing that we need is power. True and lasting change comes only through God's grace. Philippians 2.13 reminds us of that, that he is at work in us to will and to act according to his good purpose. That's not on the screen, but that's kind of a, a running verse that is appropriate for this whole series. It is God's power that's in us that is working in us, not only to give us the power to do what we should do, but also giving us even the desire to do what we know we should do. There's no power apart from God. There's power in his word. There's power as the Holy Spirit moves in our hearts and gives us the strength and the courage to do what God would have us to do. And I will just kind of emphasize here that the catalyst for power is prayer. We can't have any power unless we ask God for that power. We have to be communicating with him. We have to be talking with him. We have to be in prayer. We must continually pray and ask God to give us the power we need to overcome our hurts, our habits, and our hangups. So that's power. The second P is process. We've talked a lot in the last seven weeks, and we will today, about the process of living free. What What does it mean? What are the steps that we need to take? What is the process that we need to go through to be truly free? The process by which we begin to live in freedom involves a series of choices that we make and continue to make on a daily basis. Let me reiterate here, this is not a choice. It's a series of choices. It's a repetition of choices that we do on a daily basis. Freedom is not something we choose to do one day and then we have freedom. Freedom is something that we choose to do today because that's all we have is today. That's all we're guaranteed is today, this very moment. We choose to be free in that moment. We make a choice to do something. And then we wake up tomorrow, we make that same choice again to be free. We wake up the next day, we make that choice again, okay? And I talked in my, the first time I got up here about getting help, um, skipping ahead a little bit in the slides, but I talked a little about about getting help and believing that God exists, that I matter to him, that he has the power to help me recover. Those three things that we have to earnestly believe. I have to make that choice every day. I earnestly believe that God is who he says he is. I earnestly believe that he loves me. And I earnestly believe that he is the only one that has the power to help me get over whatever it is that I'm struggling with. That choice I have to make every single day. It's not something I made 10 years ago and then I forgot about. And make that choice every single day. Okay? So I want to encourage you with that. So let's go through this process. I want to kind of review where we've been um, about eight weeks ago to today. And then we'll go into what we're going to talk about today. The first thing that we did in this process is that we admitted need. Admitting need. This is the reality choice. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That poor in spirit has nothing to do with money. That poor in spirit has to do with realizing that in and of myself, I have no power. In and of myself, I have no strength. The power to do what I need to do comes from God. And I need to admit that, admitting that I have a problem. Kate so well talked about that just a moment ago. 
just admit that you have a problem. Even if you don't speak it to someone exactly what that problem is, just admit it to someone. Hey, I've got a problem. Okay? That's the reality choice. The second choice that we need to make is we need to get help. That's the hope choice. We talked about that on the second week. Philippians 2.13, I referenced this earlier, says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good purpose or his good pleasure. This is God's power that's, it, that's at work in us, not our own power. That's the hope that we have. Our hope is not in ourselves to pull us up by our own books, bootstraps and get out of this hole or, or pit that we might be in. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in his power, not our own. The third choice that we need to make is the commitment choice. Chuck talked about this on week three, letting go. Our verse for that is Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is letting go of our lives and saying, I'm going to let go. I'm going to submit to the authority of God and say, God, here's my life. Here's everything that I am. I need your help. Will you help me? I'm going to surrender myself to you. That's the commitment choice. After we take those first three steps, we get to the fourth one, which is coming clean. This is the house cleaning choice. And I love Isaiah 118, which says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Back in step two, getting help, or I'm sorry, back in step one, where we admit our need, all we're doing is admitting that we have a problem. But when we get to this fourth step, coming clean, the house cleaning choice, we start to get specific. We say, this is what I'm struggling with. And that might be something you just want to share with God at first, but I want to encourage you to get, go deeper, as Kate also said. Go deeper and say, let's get a little crazy here. I'm going to actually tell you what this struggle is. I'm going to share that with one other person that I trust. I'm going to share it with God. He already knows. And I, I know it because I'm going through it. But I want to just get this, divide that burden a little bit and share it with somebody else that I trust. This is the house cleaning choice where we share that with someone else as well. In 1 John, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful to do that. He knows already, but we just have to admit it and say, God, here's what I'm struggling with. Here are my sins. Here's my struggle. And I know you will forgive me and make it right. We get to the fifth choice, which is the transformation, transformation choice, making changes. Roman tw Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is where we start to submit or surrender to the changes that God wants to make in our lives. We'll hear it. If we listen carefully and as we pray and as we confess our sins, God is going to ask us to do some things, and we need to be willing to make those choices, make those changes. That's the transformation choice. Chuck talked about relationships next. This is the repairing relationships, the relationship choice. Matthew 5, 7, and 9, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, and blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This is where we start to mend relationships. God reveals to us rifts that we may have with someone else, unforgiveness that we're harboring in our hearts, a relationship that needs to be repaired in this world. We need each other. And in order to, to effectively allow people to work in our lives, we need to have good relationships with other people. And we can't have that if we haven't forgiven other people, if we haven't made those amends, if we haven't made things right with the people that we've offended, or we haven't offered forgiveness to those people who have offended us. We have to make that right. That's the relationship choice. And then... Last week, maintaining momentum, the growth choice. 2 Corinthians 13.5 tells us to examine yourselves. See whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? This is where we keep growing, and we keep praying, and we keep reading the Word, and we keep fellowshipping with one another. We continue to make those amends. We continue to offer forgiveness we continue to grow in our relationship with the Lord. That's the growth choice. 
So as we continue on this journey, we begin to realize that we need others in our lives to help us along the way. We have also discovered that it was never intended that we do this alone. We need each other in this process for support, for accountability, and for encouragement. The importance of people cannot be overstated. That is why we're going to spend some time today talking about one of the main purposes of all of this. It is people. That's the bottom line. It's people. Not only do we need others to help us in our journey of healing, but we begin to understand that the purpose of the journey itself is for others. And when I hear that, it rubs against my flesh the wrong way because I'm thinking, okay, this journey is about me and my hurts and my habits and my struggles. But it's really not. It's about getting help for that so that I can help someone else. It really is about that. Esteem others as more important than yourselves. I don't know about you, but there's a selfish part of me that doesn't want to hear that. I want to be okay for myself, but then God is saying, okay, I'm going to help you, not just to help you, but I'm going to help you so that you can be a help to others. We cannot keep this to ourselves. We're not supposed to keep it to ourselves. The hope that we have found in Christ is for the purpose of carrying the same message of hope to others. As God begins to make changes in our lives, we should carry this message to others, sharing the message of hope that we have with anyone who will listen. And one of my favorite verses about this topic is 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. It makes this really clear. Verse 19 is the only one that's on the screen, but therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And here's the key verse. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That's the purpose. Not so we can keep it to ourselves and say, look how what God has done in my life, and I'm so great, but here's what God has done in my life, and he has entrusted that message of hope so I can share it with other people. It's the message of reconciliation that he has entrusted us with. We're sharing that hope that God has given us with others. That's his purpose. That's why Jesus came, not to condemn the world, by through him that the world might be saved. That's the message that we need to be carrying to others. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the end of that passage. There's a reason that we go through any and everything that we go through. There's a purpose behind all of that that God is carrying out through his sovereign will. In a very familiar passage, Romans 8, 28, Paul declares the same thought. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Ultimately, God's purpose is to bring himself glory. But in the process of glorifying God, we find help for our struggles, our hurt, our pain as we help each other overcome. And that process of loving each other through life brings God glory. This is a wonderfully vicious cycle. God helps us, and we find help and encouragement and healing. And then we help others find that same hope that we found in Christ. And in that process, God is glorified. It's a vicious cycle that just keeps repeating. God helps us. We share that hope with others. Others are healed. Others grow in their in their life, in their journey, in their relationship with Christ, and they spread that news to other people, and it just blossoms and grows. What an amazing thought that the God of the universe has included us in that purpose and uses us in that purpose, and it all results in good toward us. True freedom, true freedom is being enslaved, so to speak, to God connected with him and his grand purpose for all of creation. Wow. To be included in his overall plan is the supreme reality of freedom. 
being a part of his plan is the supreme reality of freedom. I believe with all of my heart that everything in my life, good, bad, and indifferent, is being used to bring God glory by bringing about good in the lives of others. It is being recycled for that very purpose. That is what the last installment of this Living Free Sermon series is all about. And this is the last choice in our series. It's called Recycling Pain, the Sharing Choice. We use that word recycle a lot of in our, cult, in our culture. I put out my blue bin every Monday morning to make sure it's out there by the curb. And I, in that blue bin is a, you know, plastic bottles and milk jugs and paper bags. Probably, I don't think paper bags really are supposed to go in there, but I put those in there too, those plastic bags that you get from Walmart, all of that stuff. And I put that in that bin and they take it and I don't know what they do with it. I don't know the process. But there is something out there in our society that contains some of that stuff that has been used and discarded and thrown away by me. If you look up recycle in the dictionary, this is what you'll find. To bring back, to adapt to a new use. I love this definition because it is a picture of how God takes what was causing me pain and distress and he uses it for a completely new and different purpose. Kate couldn't have said it any better than what she said this morning. Everything that she went through in her life, in her addiction, the disease of addiction that she has, has struggled with, God took that and has repurposed it for something greater for her to be a foster parent. Wow, what a beautiful picture of recycling pain. You know, what was a struggle in her life? God has blessed her with a gift to be used for a completely new and different purpose. Wow. A big question that we may sometimes ask, if God is good, why is there pain in my life? And I'm going to suggest that there are four main reasons for this. There are four main reasons why we have pain in our life or why God allows pain in our life. Let's go through these. Number one, God has given us free will. God has given us free will. This has a lot of implications. We're free to choose right or wrong, but we are not free from the consequences of those choices. Remember, living free is about a series of choices, admitting our need, getting help, committing to God, house cleaning, transformation, repairing relationships, and continuing to grow. The consequences of right choices are good, and there are often negative consequences for poor choices. We have the power to choose. So what will we choose? Will we choose to believe the truth or will we choose to believe the lies? The Bible is full of statements that demand that we choose one thing or another. And here's some things that I like about scripture. It, there's often places in, in, in God's word where there's uh, something put before us where we can choose one or the other. Like when Joshua tells the children of Israel to choose this day whom you will serve. Or in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a choice there. We can either conform to the world or we can be transformed by renewing the way that we think. Or 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us. We can hold on to our sins and not share them and not confess them or we can confess them and receive the forgiveness from God. So God has given us free will. We have a choice, okay? That's one aspect of our free will and, and why we have pain. The second reason that we have pain or God allows pain is God uses pain to get our attention. God uses pain to get our attention. I know that's been true in my life. This pain can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be psychological, or any other type of pain. God uses any and all of it to get our attention in some way. And I'm not saying that God uses pain to punish us in any way, but he allows that pain to be in our lives to try to get our attention, to get our, our, our attention. This can be in the form of discipline. Proverbs 20:30 says, blows that wound cleanse away evil. Strokes make clean the innermost parts. And if you meditate on that, what it's saying is that sometimes there's physical pain, blows, or strokes 
And that is used by God to clean the innermost parts, to, get our, to change something that's going on in our inner selves, in our inner man. So I really do truly believe that God allows physical pain, emotional pain, sometimes to get our attention. It doesn't give him pleasure to do that, but he uses that pain to get our attention to change something in us. We are sometimes struck with blows that bruise. Physical discipline can steer man from evil and cleanse the inner man. God uses pain to speak to us. All right, this isn't in my notes, so I'm going to take a little detour. But I, I'm remembering a story someone told about um, what's the disease in the Bible? Leprosy. And how, how much of a blessing that pain is for someone who has or may think they have leprosy. And this was a big problem. People would go around, walking around in society, and not know that they were cut or that they had hurt themselves in some way because with leprosy, you can't feel pain. And it's a blessing. <laughs> it's hard to look at it this way, but it's a blessing to experience pain. How else will you know that you're hurt? You know, toothache. I've had many toothaches in my life. And when I go to the dentist, sometimes I find out that there's a rotting uh, something in my mouth, in my tooth, and in, in the dental um, uh, tissue there that I would have never known about, and it's infected or it could possibly cause a lot of other problems. I would have never known about it if I didn't feel that initial pain and did something about it. So don't reject pain or don't look at it as something that's being used to punish you, but use, look at it as a warning sign. There's something that's not right and that needs to be addressed. Let's also remember the admonition given to us in Hebrews 12, 7. And there are some key phrases in this passage, 12, 7 through 11. Hebrews 12, 7 through 11. There's some key phrases here that help us understand the purpose of God's discipline in our lives, why he allows pain. And I'm going to stop and highlight these as we read through the verse. Starting in verse 7, it says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. The word endure. So discipline produces endurance. God is treating you as sons. He's treating us as sons. In other words, he cares for us. He loves us. And the reason he disciplines us and allows pain in our lives sometimes, because he loves us. And there's something he's trying to get our attention for. He's speaking to us. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, and I'm so glad that's in there because it reminds us all of us have participated in the discipline of God. If we belong to him, we're not alone. And we can look to others for that shared pain. Hey, what are you struggling with? This is what I'm struggling with. Are you, you're struggling with the same thing? Maybe God is trying to speak to us, and maybe that's something we can talk about and get encouragement and support for. So if you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this... We have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? So another purpose for discipline and why God allows pain is so that we can live. We can have an abundant life. Verse 10, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines for us for our good that we may share his holiness. Everything that we go through, Romans 8.28, is designed for our good. And this verse says that the purpose of it, one of the purposes, is so that we can share his holiness. That's what he's trying to accomplish in our lives. Verse 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been, who have been trained by it. So that we may share his holiness and live a righteous life. That's what it's about. Let's move on to number three. The third reason God um, allows pain in our life is that he uses it to teach us to depend on him. God uses pain to teach us to depend on him. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 9 says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. 
For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Have you ever been in a point in your life over some issue or circumstance where you just threw your hands in the air and said, I can't do this. I, I don't know where to turn. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. I've been there many times. And every time that forces me to depend on my father. Our confidence has to be in God, not in ourselves. That can be in ministry. That can be where you work. That can be at school, wherever you are. God is trying to say, depend on me, not on your own resources. This idea is in Psalm 119.71 as well. Psalm 119.71 says, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. How can someone say that? It was good that you afflicted me. Why? So that I might learn your statutes. Verse 75 says, I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. The fourth reason God uses pain, and this is what recycling is all about, is to give us a ministry to others. 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, God, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So we go through pain and difficult circumstances. God comforts us. And we take that comfort and we share that comfort and hope with others. That's recycling pain. So what do we do with all of this? What are the next steps? I think one of the most important things that we can do is simply to share our story. That's why we've had Kate come up here and Justin and myself and others come up and tell their story to put a real face on this so that it's not just words, it's real people dealing with real issues. So it's important that we share our story. And that's why we've had both those people come. And if, uh, I have deeply, I have been deeply moved by the stories I've heard. More importantly, I've been encouraged by the faith of others and inspired to continue sharing my own story. And I hope you have too. I hope the one thing, well, one of many, but I hope one thing that you've gotten from this series is a confidence and a boldness to be able to open up and share your story with someone else. There's nothing more powerful than hearing how God has changed someone's life. That is one of my favorite things about Monday night at Celebrate Recovery is hearing testimonies. We do that twice a month, and I look forward to those nights because I get to hear most of the time a, a real live person come up here and share, this is where I was, this is how I met Jesus, this is what I still struggle with, and this is how God is helping me to overcome it. And hearing that story never gets old. <laughs> regardless of the struggle, regardless of the path, regardless of the journey, it always ends with, Jesus is my hope. And this is how I'm getting through this. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Always be ready to share the hope that you have in Christ. The same idea is in Acts 20, 24, which says, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. It is so important to be prepared to share your story. This doesn't mean getting up here necessarily. It doesn't mean going out on the street and yelling and telling people on the street your story. It just means wherever you're called to be, wherever you are, in your job, at work, at home, in school, wherever you are, if you have an opportunity, share your story and be prepared to share your story. And this may seem a little daunting at first to consider this, but it's really quite simple. Um, just tell them about your life before Jesus how I came to know Jesus, and how my life has changed since coming to know him. And this can be, um, I call it an elevator testimony. If you're on an elevator with someone, you have about one or two minutes to, to engage with that person. And those are the three things you can share. My life before Christ, 
how I came to know Jesus, and what my life is like since coming to know him. All right, so this is daunting. Um, here's a question that was suggested to me a couple of years ago on how to get that conversation started. Just simply ask the question, how are you doing spiritually? You can do that with anybody, even a perfect stranger. No? How are you doing spiritually? And you can tell by their response if they're open to talking about it. And if they're not, that's okay. God will put somebody else in your path. But just be, ask that question, how are you doing spiritually? And if they're not wanting to talk with it, they'll either ignore you or say, I don't want to talk about that man or whatever. But just put that question out there, and that's okay. It may be some like a, an experience that I had a few years ago with a student who was uh, um, um, from um, Saudi Arabia. Um, and I don't make it a, a habit to raise issues of spirituality when I teach at UCA. But if the door is open, even just a little bit, I knock it open. <laughs> and he came to my office and... He was, I don't know how we even got on the topic. Oh, I know how we got on the topic. One of the pieces of music that I played in my class was a, an Islamic call to prayer. And I use it for, um, to teach about different musical traditions, different music in different cultures. And he started talking about that. And somehow we got on the topic of religion. And I just took the opportunity to just crack that door open just a little bit wider. And I said, well, in my tradition, this is what I believe. And we had a great conversation about it. And then I just was completely quiet and allowed him to tell me about his faith tradition without judgment, without any facial tics or anything that communicated that I was judging him in any way. I just listened. And you know what he said to me at the end of that conversation in my office? Is that the, that was the first time that he was able to have a conversation about religion without it turning into an argument or becoming heated or something like that because of what he believed. And I was able to share Christ and step back and not intervene and not try to make something happen in that moment, but just to let the Holy Spirit do whatever the Holy Spirit wanted to do in that moment. I was just faithful to share. And I would encourage you, if you have opportunities like that, don't be afraid to, to venture into that. Have a little faith and step out in faith. Some practical things to consider as you share your story. There are three things. They should be up there. The next slide. Yep. Be humble. Be real. And don't lecture. Be humble. You're not fixed. You're not cured from whatever you're struggling from, with. You haven't arrived, so to speak. You're just on the right path toward healing. Communicate that. Be real. In other words, be honest. You don't have to use fancy words or try to be like someone else or try to sound like a pastor or a preacher. Just be yourself. Be real and be honest about what, where you are. And then thirdly, don't lecture. Just talk. Have a conversation. We should always be ready to tell someone of the hope that we have found in Christ. That is how God uses our pain, our journey, our story to bring about hope encouragement, and good to the lives of others. I encourage you today to pursue with everything in your being that calling. You have a ministry, whether you know it or not. It may not look like mine or Chuck's or Randall's or anyone else's. It may not be in some official capacity, but you have a ministry wherever God has planted you, in your home, at work, here at Mosaic, in Celebrate Recovery, wherever you're planted, Share your story so that someone else may experience the good that God has for them. And all of this is possible with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I always end with this because it's one of the most succinct verses that I know that communicates the gospel message. Romans 10, 9 and 10. I don't think it's on the screen, but I'll just um, uh, read it. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I can't judge you and know what's in your heart. Only God does. So if that's the belief and the desire of your heart, you can pray that prayer right now and know that you will be saved. Simple faith. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. The gospel message is a simple message, but it's so profound. 
if you believe that in your heart, you can pray that prayer right now and uh, be saved and know that you have a, a home in God's kingdom. I want to invite our worship team to come on back up, and I'm going to just um, close by with a little personal reflection today. Hopefully I'm not too much over time, a little bit. Um, I'll close quickly just to say that I've been blessed to be able to share with you three times so far in this recovery series, and I truly want to invite you to start this journey. We have started our um, Freedom That Last study this morning, Kate and I have, and it's, it was a blessing this morning, and I want to say again that we want to invite you to be a part of that. If you want to continue to have a discussion about this, dive a little deeper and make it more real and more personal, I invite you to be a part of that study for the next five weeks now. So you haven't missed um, anything that you can't recover from if you'd missed this morning. So don't feel like you can't come next week. Next Sunday morning, 830, we'll meet in the back. And we would love to have you.